Greetings BIOS 6618. In this lecture, we're going to discuss quantile regression. We'll first walk through some of the theory and background of the method and then see an example using R. So let's start with some motivation. We've primarily focused on linear regression in our class this semester. And this is the case, remember, where we model the mean of our outcome Y conditional on some predictors X1 through, let's say, XP. However, we've discussed and seen that there are certain cases where we might be concerned about the assumptions linear regression makes. For example, we may have outliers in our data that we're worried are affecting the estimation of our mean and our variability. We may find that our residuals have a non-normal distribution violating that assumption. We could see that the conditional distribution of Y is asymmetric, so it doesn't have that nice bell-shaped normal symmetric property. There could also be multiple modes in our data or heteroscedastic variances. Now we've discussed some ways we can address these uh, issues in different contexts, such as data transformations, or maybe sensitivity analyses removing outliers with a very careful thought about the implications of doing so. However, there are other alternative modeling strategies to consider. And one such strategy, of course, based on the name of this lecture, is quantile regression. And this is really an extension of linear regression. Whereas linear regression models the conditional mean, quantile regression models the conditional quantile. Now this might be something like the median, or it could even be something more specific, like the 5th percentile, 75th percentile, etc. And oftentimes we'll denote this by the notation here, tau. Now this modeling approach can be especially advantageous if our linear regression assumptions are not, not met, but also could be useful if we're actually interested in modeling quantiles, not just the mean, but things like that fifth percentile or other quantiles. For example, one could, and we have plenty of examples actually, of individuals constructing growth curves by modeling different quantiles based on a data set such as n Haynes. Or you might be interested in modeling across the distribution of your data to estimate associations in the tails or the more extreme areas of your relationships. So let's break down for a second how this is an extension from linear regression. So let's start by focusing here in the top part of the slide. This is really a refresher of our linear regression model. At the very top, we see we have our outcome yi, we have our intercept term, as well as all of these various predictor terms of interest. We also have a plus epsilon or error term, which we assume to be normally distributed with a common or homoscedastic variance. Now what this really comes down to ultimately is that we are estimating a conditional mean which may be represented by that lower equation, the expectation of yi given x is equal to all of these betas added uh, multiplied by the predictors of our participants or observations. Now this is very similar actually in quantile regression. In this case, we now see on the bottom of the slide a very similar setup, but here I've added this little um, sort of superscript notation of tau to distinguish that we're actually not thinking of it this in the linear regression context, but estimating the tau quantile. So again, that median or fifth percentile or 75th percentile. Now we do see here there is still an assumption of some sort of error term. Again, we're calling it just for consistency here, epsilon i with that tau superscript. But it has a much more relaxed assumption where we see that the conditional quantile of the error term given x, our predictors, is equal to zero, and we assume nothing about variances. We can then see the conditional quantiles given in a very similar setup where that tau parameter will vary and affect the beta coefficient estimates depending on if it's the fifth percentile, median, or whatever percentile we're estimating. Now we also have to think about how you'd actually estimate these beta coefficients in quantile regression. So we know that in ordinary least squares linear regression, uh, we estimated our regression coefficients based off of a minimization of the sum of squared errors. And so we can see here just a reminder of what that looked like from our earlier lecture, where we take that sum of our residuals essentially are the observed yi minus our predicted y hat i and sum up over every one of those squared values. Now, in the more maybe straightforward or analogous case of quantile regression of the median, we can actually think of this as minimizing the absolute sum of errors. So no longer are they squared, but we have these absolute values being placed around them. More generally though, because we can use quantile regression to flexibly estimate things like the first percentile, 42nd percentile, or whatever we're interested in, we actually have this objective function we've designed below here. Now, it looks somewhat similar above. We do see still the absolute um, 
error term here, yi minus in our matrix notation, x beta with the tau term there, because again, the beta coefficients can change for each percentile reflecting the data we have. We do see it's a little more complicated here with the summations. And in fact, we can know that unlike in ordinary least squares, we had that nice algebraic derivation in a previous lecture, we actually don't have a nice closed form solution. And instead it requires an algorithmic approach. For the sake of our class, we'll do this using the quant reg package in R, but one could also code up your own algorithm to do the estimation. So let's summarize a few of these comparisons between quantile and linear regression, just to see what some of the similarities and differences are. And this comes from a SAS proceedings paper that has a nice little walkthrough of some of these properties more generally. The first we can note here is that it models conditional on the mean for linear regression versus conditional quantiles for quantile regression. One thing to note that can be a trade-off is that linear regression based on our asymptotic theory and the assumptions of normality still apply when n is small, although we may be concerned about those assumptions. Whereas quantile regression with their more relaxed assumptions actually needs what we call quote unquote sufficient data or enough sample size to estimate what's there. And we'll talk a bit more about this in a second. A third assumption in linear regression is that we often are assuming normality versus quantile regression, which can be thought of as distribution agnostic. A fourth assumption or point to make is that linear regression does not preserve the expected value of y given x under transformation. And we saw this before with things like log transformations of our outcome. We're taking these actually do not preserve the relationship between the beta coefficients and the original scale y or the transformed scale. On the other hand, with quantiles, as long as we have this transformation here, we will maintain the ordering and the estimation of each quantile. We can also note that linear regression can be sensitive to outliers, whereas quantile regression tends to be robust to response outliers. And finally, linear regression in the terms of computation is pretty inexpensive. We've actually, again, have derived various matrix approaches and we know these nice closed form solutions. Whereas quantile regression is a little more computationally intensive, nothing that we really will notice for examples in our class. But if you were timing how long it takes to run these models and let's say doing a simulation study, that could be a point to consider. So let's break down quickly that need for a sufficient sample size. Whereas linear regression works well even when n is small, assuming our assumptions are met, quantile regression has that assumption of a sufficient sample size for estimation. And so, of course, the natural question is, well, what's sufficient? Well, the answer, of course, in statistics is it depends. It depends here on what quantile or quantiles you're trying to estimate. If you're estimating the median, you might not need as much data because as we think about, it's really just the 50th percentile, the middle of all of our observations. However, if you're estimating an extreme quantile, more data will be needed. For example, if your sample only has 20 observations, you might not have much confidence in estimating that 99th percentile because you actually don't even have a data point really to maybe correspond there. However, if you have 2,000 individuals, you can imagine you'd have multiple observations that you would think of as being in the 99th percentile or just more likely to observe data from the population in your sample that truly meet that assumption. Let's talk about the interpretations of a quantile regression model. And we'll root ourselves at the top here in a multiple quantile regression setup where we have x1 to xk predictors, which could be continuous or categorical. And we'll see that each one has a corresponding beta coefficient, much like linear regression. Again, that tau superscript represents or reminds us that this is the estimate for the tauth quantile, especially if we're estimating multiple quantiles in the model at once. Now let's focus first on that intercept term, beta naught. Beta naught will be our estimated value of y for that tau quantile when all of the predictors x1 through xk are set equal to zero or if they're categorical to their reference category. The slope is very similar as well, where beta j will be the change in y associated with a one unit change or increase in x sub j for that tau quantile. With the important note here, because this is a multiple regression model, that we're assuming all other predictors are held constant or are set at a fixed value. As we can note, this interpretation is very similar to that of linear regression, except for it's with respect to the estimated value of a given quantile where it's potential difference between categorical predictors or for that one unit change in a continuous predictor instead of the expected mean change. So with this background and information, let's walk through a brief quantile regression example in R. 
Now to do this, we'll use the quantreg package for our example, which is going to explore the association between infant birth weight in grams, which is the dbwt variable of this data set, and a continuous predictor of gestational age in weeks. From a random sample of 2,500 births from the 2018 US natality public use file, and we're gonna be estimating the 10th, 50th, and 99th percentiles of this distribution. We see below here in the distribution of the data that we might have some concerns about the spread of the data where it looks like there potentially is a slight fan shape, possibly, although there is sparse data towards the small, lower gestational age weeks. And we may have some other concerns about trying to model or interest in modeling what the highs or lows may be that 10th or 99th percentile of birth weight given a gestational age. So let's first introduce this package to get us up to speed to be able to use the and see the example. The quantrig package includes lots and lots of options, and we're going to see a small little snippet of them here. And one of the cool things we can do is fit multiple quantiles or percentiles at once within the quantile regression framework using this RQ function. Now you'll see if you look at the help documentation, there's a method argument that defines the algorithmic method used to estimate the parameters. As I mentioned, there's multiple ways one could approach this. And the methods will have different trade-offs for estimation, sample size, and so forth. But we'll, for today's example, focus on just using the default BR option. So let's start here by walking through the code at the top first. We're going to see that we are in the first line of code loading a few packages, namely quantreg and also ggplot for some visualization. We then see that our model structure using RQ looks very similar to a regression model. What I've just circled here briefly is that Y tilde X sort of prediction framework here. So we're really looking at that infant birth weight predicted by the gestational age in weeks. We'll then define the data source here, which we've already loaded in as DAT. And then again, the nifty thing about this quant reg package and the RQ function is that we can specify multiple quantiles or tau values to estimate simultaneously within the function. So here we see we're going to estimate tau 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0.99. Now once we fit this model, we're interested to see what the printed estimated coefficients are. So we can simply start by just putting mod in our code, and we see we get the following output. Now there's an interesting setup here and a few things to note. We'll start here by focusing first on the intercept. Like many models, the intercept does not actually make a lot of scientific sense to interpret. Because remember, our predictor is gestational age in weeks, and we don't really have values that go down to zero or conception. So while we can interpret this as the expected birth weight um, when an infant is conceived, it really just is extrapolation and doesn't make a lot of sense. However, we can interpret the effect of a one week increase in gestational age for an increase in birth weight for the 10th, 50th, or 99th percentile. And we see here that on average it'll be 143.2, 131.3, or 94.0 grams, respectively, for that 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile. Again, the interesting thing to note here, and maybe it's not super extreme in this example, but the slope is different for the different quantiles. We can see that at the 10th percentile, for example, it's 143, but it's only 94 at the 99th percentile. This allows us to have different relationships and associations at different percentiles, and even in more complex models to fit potentially nonlinear trends in our quantile regression as well. One other thing we'll note here is that there are no p-values or estimated pieces of information in this just mod printed object. It just is giving us the formula or the call and our coefficients for that intercept in any predictors. In many cases, we'll also want to not just have our estimates, but some decision about the significance statistically of those coefficients. So here we're going to see an example of using the summary function where we have to specify some sort of standard error calculation. Here we'll use NID to get p-values, and we'll also just focus for the sake of space on extracting the results for the median, noting that it's a very similar approach that could summarize everything or just with these double square brackets, each of the quantiles we fit. Now, as you note below here, we do have to specify that standard error argument for how these standard errors would calculate. There are multiple approaches or assumptions. Now, if you have sample sizes that are over a thousand like we do, NID is also the default, but we specify it here just for exactness. Now, if we look at the model output, we actually see that in this case, in our p-value column, 
both the intercept and the gestational age at the median have very significant effects that are significantly different from zero. In other words, they're much less than 0.001, and we will reject the null hypothesis, for example, that beta combined gestational age is equal to zero. But we do see a limitation here with this option that there are no confidence intervals yet provided. Now, a further note that you may notice at the very top of our slide here, we have this little warning message about 47 non-positive fists. There can be some quirks with quantile regression, and so it's important to look at these errors or issues as they come up. But as an example, if you Google this one, you'll find a quote that says it's generally harmless, leading to somewhat conservative or larger estimates of the standard errors. Um, and there's a link here you can look at to explore more if you're wondering about other types of common errors. But if you are wondering how to get a confidence interval, how might we approach that? Well, in this case for our data, we actually might have to look at specifying some different approach or estimation procedure. Um, so for example, the rank option of standard error, if appropriate, can provide some estimated uh, confidence intervals. In our case, we can also use a bootstrap approach, leveraging the built-in functionality within the quantile regression package. So for example, we can see at the very top here, we can set a seed for reproducibility, since the bootstrap is resampling with replacement randomly. And we see we can use this boot RQ function where we provide it with from the model outcome objects, this X and Y object. In this case, we'll specify that we want just the median to correspond to our last slide. And for sake of illustration, we'll choose 200 replicates or in, uh, representations, uh, but you could specify even more if you'd like. Now, after doing this approach here, we can then estimate a 95% bootstrap percentile interval. So here you can see we're just going through our bootstrap samples here and estimating this at the 2.5th and 97.5th percentiles of the bootstrap distribution. And we see that we get our confidence intervals down here for beta not hat and beta one hat for our given uh, median estimates. Or in other words, we're 95% confident that beta not hat is between negative 21506 and negative 1202 grams. Again, not really interpretable in this case or more meaningful, we are 95% confident that beta hat comb just is between 116 and 150 grams. Or in other words, the weight change for an additional week of gestational age is between 116 and 150. No, we also may though, we're not gonna go into this detail here, but wish to evaluate the performance of our bootstrap percentile interval. For example, is the absolute bias divided by the standard error of our bootstrap distribution less than our rule of thumb of 0.1? Now, one of the cool things we can also do with quantile regression is to actually visualize how these quantiles may change or have different slopes over time. In our data set here, it's not super different, but I did want to give a brief example using ggplot and how you can plot your data and the predictive fits, as well as a comparison of the linear regression line here. So you see that this blue line with slight shading is our linear regression fit, which is actually quite similar to the median estimate, which is purple or that 50th percentile there. Our 10th percentile is right at the bottom, and then our 99th percentile is that green line near the top. Unsurprisingly, we see that that 99th percentile has very few points lying above it, thanks to our large sample size, but there are still a few because there is a whole percentile of observations we would expect to be more extreme. Likewise, at the median, approximately we would visually see half above and half below, which is how that model is fit. Now we can imagine when we're fitting maybe growth curves with nonlinear trends for like height for age or things like that, we may have some more interesting effects or changes or dispersions over time. But even here, we can also see that there's a closing of the gap serve as we get higher and higher up in gestational age between these percentiles. So a few closing thoughts. This lecture serves as just an introduction to quantile regression as an alternative to linear regression, especially if our assumptions may be violated. Your quantile regression, although our example was simple, can be much more complex and include actually multiple predictors. It could also add those nonlinear terms like splines or polynomial terms. There's also non-parametric approaches to the estimation of quantile regression models and models you can even use for sensor data. Now that's a bit out of the scope of our class, but I think it's helpful to be aware that there are alternatives and strategies here to use for different data types or strategies that you can explore more in the future. With that, thank you for your attention for this lecture. Look forward to chatting about more statistical topics in the next one.